Hello, and welcome to Learn the Bible. Today we are going to cover post 183. This is on numbers 13 and 14. I will not repent. So in these chapters, God instructs Moses that the people have come to the land of Canaan, and it was time to inherit the promised land. So he told them, send out some spies to check out this promised land to see what it has to offer. They're to send one person from each tribe, and there are 12 tribes, so technically 13, if you count how uh, Joseph's tribe split into Manasseh and Ephraim, but to send one person to, from each tribe, so 12 people, to go into this promised land to see what it has to offer. So among these people, there's these two men, one from the tribe of Judah named Caleb, and one from the tribe of Ephraim named Joshua. So there are 10 other men, of course, one from each tribe, and they go with them into this land. And as they're going, they find a beautiful land. They say it's a land flowing with milk and honey. There's lots of food, there's lots of water, there's everything they need to be a prosperous nation. And God had promised them that they would get the land. And so far, every promise he had given them had come true thus far. So they took a survey of the land and they cut one cluster of grapes, just to give you an idea how beautiful this land was. They cut one cluster of grapes and it took two men to carry this cluster back how full it was. The fruit was so, so huge and it was just amazing. So they come back to show the people of Israel just how amazing the land was. And they talked about how the land itself provided the food freely. And that's where they called it a land just flowing with milk and honey. That doesn't mean there were rivers of milk. They're saying that the livestock were plenteous, the flowers, the land was plenteous, that it would produce lots of honey. So sadly, though, a good land like this doesn't go ignored, especially in areas where there's a lot of desert. So there were all kinds of tribes. There were even races of gigantic people, 14, 15, 16 feet tall powerful nations living in this land. Each of them had carved out a piece of the land for themselves. And relative to the size of some of these other nations, the Israelites, they felt like they were too small and they actually called themselves like insects or specifically grasshoppers. So despite hearing how wonderful all this land was, the people get so discouraged by this report. And they're like, there's no way we can take over these people. We're going, we came here to die. So what did they do? They began to speak badly against Moses and Aaron and, of course, in turn, God. They say, we wish we had never been brought to this wilderness. There's no chance we could win. We're going to be killed here, and our wives and our children will become slaves to these giants. They even considered returning to Egypt. They didn't think about all the miraculous things God did for them in Egypt through the plagues on Egypt how they crossed the Red Sea, how water came from the rock, how manna came from heaven. They just didn't consider any of these things. But those two specific men, Joshua and Caleb, they tried to encourage the people and say, listen, the land is wonderful, but God will give it to us. God will make us victorious because he has been with us and he is still with us. They begged the people, don't rebel against God. And they argued, there's nothing to fear if God's on your side. But rather than listening to these two faithful men, the people decided, let's kill them. They're trying to get us killed. Let's kill them. So let's try and stone them. And God says, you know what, Moses, these people are wicked. And so God actually tells Moses that he thinks the people of Israel deserve to die right there on the spot because that's what they claimed would happen. And that he offered to Moses, Moses, you can bring forth a new nation in their place from your offspring. And this is a beautiful picture because here we see Moses then interceding for the people. So the people had sinned and God was judging their sin and their rebellion. But Moses intercedes and asks God to save them for his behalf. So he argues that it would hurt the reputation of God to do such a thing so the Egyptians would feel like they were vindicated. So they would think that maybe perhaps God wasn't powerful enough to bring the people of Israel to the promised land. So Moses then reminds God about God's own words, how God is patient and merciful and forgiving. So then God agrees with the intercession and he forgives the people. He says, I have pardoned according to thy word. But that doesn't mean they're not going to pay the consequences for their rebellion. So God says in Numbers 14, verse 20, that he's forgiven them. But because of their rebellion, 
and their refusal to enter the promised land, they indeed would not enter. He had given them 10 chances and all 10 times they rebelled. The only two people from age 20 years old and upward that could enter the promised land were those two faithful witnesses, Caleb and Joshua. And they were the ones who were trying to persuade the people to obey God. Every single other person, 20 years old and up, including Moses and Aaron, would, would die in the wilderness. Now, Moses and Aaron for different reasons, particularly Moses. But the point is, that whole generation would die off. So Moses, he then relays the word of God to the people. And instead of rejoicing in the fact that God had forgiven them, instead of realizing how wrong they were, instead of asking God's forgiveness and accepting their sentence to that they were going to live out their lives and die in the wilderness and their children would actually get to enter the promised land, they decide to rebel again by trying to be obedient. God told them, do not go. But they said, you know what? We're going to go into the promised land anyway, because we should have in the first place. And despite what God says now, we're going to try to go in like he originally told us. They try to earn God's favor back by disobeying him again. But this time they're commanded, do not go. And Moses, you know, they ignored Moses when he told them that. And ultimately they tried to invade the promised land and they fail miserably and many of them die. Now, this is a really interesting chapter. There's a whole lot you can get out of this chapter. It also unlocks some confusing passages in the New Testament about repentance. But it should, so whenever the Bible talks about repentance, repentance simply means to turn. So if I were to change my mind, I'm repenting in thought. If I were to change my heart, I'm repenting in my heart. I'm changing in my heart. So man is commanded to repent from their sins, turn or change from my sins and turn towards God. So in the Bible, we see some repent again in thought and some repent in action. But it's interesting in the Bible, it's not only man who has to repent. It's not only man who does repent. The Bible also speaks of God repenting. Does that mean God made a mistake and had to correct it? Of course not. It simply means that we, as humans, as creatures created in the image of God, we who, even when we're in our sins, have the love of God upon us because he loves us so much, we have the ability to cause God grief, to cause God pain. We look back before the flood, when people became so wicked, so evil, God still loved them. And how do we know it loved him? Because in Genesis 6.6, 6, it says, it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. He loved mankind, but mankind would not return the love. They would not turn to him. The joy that was in his heart at creating this world for man and giving it to man after the fall and people continuing to turn towards sin rather than to God, turn God's joy to sadness, a turning. Again, it wasn't a mistake. It was just simply a response to the decisions man has made. That doesn't mean it surprised God. If I know my child has done something wrong or I know they will do something wrong, it may not surprise me, but it can still hurt me. So that means that our decisions can grieve God. So we all know what God's will is. God's will is that all should be saved. None should perish, that all should come to repentance, according to Peter. But sadly, not everyone will. Not everyone will respond to the love of God that he showed us. Jesus, he wanted to see all of Israel saved and turned to him. And when he looked at Jerusalem, he had come in with joy a few days before, but then he came over Jerusalem and he wept because he knew they would reject him. He knew they were going to reject him. It was prophesied from the Old Testament long before it happened. But it doesn't mean it didn't hurt his heart. His heart turned from joy to grieving. So in this story, we have a number of things that could have led to repentance. But unfortunately, that just wasn't the case. So the nation of Israel, they were commanded to go into the promised land, but they refused to trust God. God commands them that as a response for their lack of faith, they would die and this new nation would come from the family of Moses. But, that, but then Moses intercedes. And this is a picture of Jesus Christ. God didn't have to change his plans to send Jesus into the world. We, from the day Adam and Eve 
ate from that tree. And the day that we continue each day choosing to live in sin, we have the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the point is that our sentence is upon us, death. But just like Moses interceded for the people, Jesus intercedes for you. The Bible says there is only one mediator between God and man. That is the man, Jesus Christ. He is the one who, on our behalf, asks God's forgiveness. And just like God granted the forgiveness to the nation of Israel, again, this wasn't a surprise for God. He knew what Moses would do. But the point is, Moses had to intercede as that picture of Christ. So what happens then? God then repents of the judgment on the people. He says, fine, they will not die today. And he actually says, I have forgiven them. I have pardoned them. But he refuses to repent of the judgment pronounced. They would not enter the promised land. So he forgave them of their sin. They're still the chosen people. But they would not inherit the blessings, would not inherit the, the promised land. Instead, they would all die off and their children would inherit it. So you see how he repented of destroying them, but he did not repent of not allowing them to make it to the promised land, but they would have a natural death, a natural lifespan. So these people could have repented at that point. They could have said, God, we didn't trust in you. We're sorry. And choose to accept their sentence and live out their lives in honor of God and restore that relationship, even though they don't get the inheritance, the promised land. But instead, sadly, they did not repent and they rebelled again. And they tried to forcibly enter the promised land and end up suffering greatly for it. So we see that when we speak of repentance, right, where it says you cannot renew someone to repentance, it doesn't always mean the repentance of man. It may also mean the repentance of God. A repentance doesn't always mean a turn of action, but it also means a change of heart or a grieving of the heart. So once you get that, you begin to understand that it's necessary for us to repent of our sins. We all have sinned. Everybody in this world has sinned. And sometimes those sins bring consequences. We have to deal with those consequences. And while God can forgive us of our sins, and can save us from hell and eternal judgment, it doesn't mean that that's going to remove all the consequences of our sins or the correction of God for our sins. We need to be careful as Christians not to abuse the fact that we are secure in our salvation by being, I mean, imagine we're in the hand of God. We're in the hand of the Father and in the hand of the Son, and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. That's wonderful news. We are forever secure in Christ, but we need to live in a way that's pleasing to God, so we don't lose our inheritance, so we don't lose our rewards, just as these Israelites lost their rewards when coming to the promised land. And whenever we read passages in the New Testament, some people get a confusion between losing salvation and losing inheritance. The two are not the same. Salvation was a gift of God. All you have to do with the gift is accept it. But your rewards, your inheritance, the treasure that Jesus speaks about storing up for yourself in heaven, that can be lost by not living for God. God bless you. Thanks for joining us on Learn the Bible. We'll catch you next time. Have a great night.